Well, I grew up in a very conservative small town. My family was in business and I was the eldest son in the family, so I assumed that's what I would go back to and that's how I would spend my life. Um, in college, um, I ended up taking a senior colloquium on revolution simply because I was so concerned about, as a conservative, about communist revolutions that threatened our American way of life and found that it was poverty, with frustrations of poverty. So I actually decided to devote my life to taking the secrets of U.S. business success to the rest of the world uh, to end poverty and um, end this revolution nonsense. Um, over a period of, of 30 years, I increasingly became aware that the very processes that we were promoting in the name of development were in fact uh, pushing more and more people to the, to the margins of, of survival, uh, destroying the environment, destroying once rich cultures. Uh, it became truly horrifying when I realized that those same processes of environmental destruction, social breakdown, inequality, were playing out all around the world, including the countries that we considered to be the development models, like you know, my country, the United States. And that started an inquiry into why. Where does all of this go wrong? Um, at one point, one of, uh, one of my colleagues from India sat me down and he said, you know, we know you and Fran, my wife, uh, came over here to help us. <laughs> we think you're now beginning to understand what our problem is. And what he was telling me is that our problem, their problem, uh, is essentially the economic models that the United States is promoting to the world. So he says, if you really want to help us, you need to go home and teach what you've learned during your years abroad. And that's you know, those 21 years of living and working in, in, uh, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And Fran and I decided that that is, was indeed what we, what we needed to do. Um, we moved to New York City, and I began working on the book that uh, that became When Corporations Rule the World. Um, that launched in the fall of 1995. It was at that point I also, I got involved with the International Forum on Globalization, which was a network of, of international activist intellectuals who were sorting out among ourselves uh, what was happening with these free trade agreements like NAFTA. Uh, the outsourcing of jobs, the outrageous uh, bonuses for corporate executives. Um, and together we began to discern a, a pattern playing out all around the world of the expansion of corporate power, the, uh, the circumvention of democracy, of rewriting the rules of, of trade, of commerce, uh, but also of, of democratic governance to give priority to the rights of corporations to go wherever they wish to exploit people and exploit nature for a quick profit. Um, well, it turned out that when corporations rule the world, which spelled out that framework, uh, launched at exactly a moment when an awful lot of people were asking these kinds of questions. What's going on? Why? Is, is, does life seem to be getting harder? Why do things seem not to be working? Um, and that book helped provide answers, so it really caught on. But I was beginning to realize right at the time that uh, resistance alone is a losing strategy. That um, to, to win, <laughs> one has to have a proactive agenda. There has to be a positive vision. And so began searching for that. And I had a sense that somehow it related to life, to living systems. But the only stories of biology that I was aware of were the Darwinian stories of ruthless competition, that, uh, that the whole of evolution, the way life organizes, is competing for, for territory, for reproductive advantage, for, for food. Um, and that just 
that seemed to fit with the kind of economy we had, but it didn't really seem to fit with my sense of how things really worked, and certainly not my sense of where we needed to go. Um, so at one point, I was, I was um, actually at a conference in Spain, at, uh, and a, I just happened at one of the breaks to meet a, uh, a very petite, Asian woman who turned out to be uh, an extraordinary microbiologist, Dr. Mei Wan Ho, who was a, a leader in her field, one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. But she said, you know, I've been looking at the relationship between biology and economics. And I'm very interested in your work, but what I'm finding, and you know, what it, what it turned out is I realized that uh, she's a practitioner of the new biology, <laughs> uh, which is the study of life as it actually organizes. Uh, and the way she described it to me, she says, conventional biologists, if they wanted to understand a, a living cell, they grind it up so they can study its chemical composition and they think they've learned something about life. Uh, in the new biology, we study the living cell we want to understand how it manages energy, nutrients, water, information. Um, and then the living systems and how cells exchange information, how they organize within our bodies. And of course our bodies have, are comprised of each of our bodies of anywhere from 30 to 70 trillion uh, individual living cells not even counting the, micro, uh, the, the microbes, the many more trillions that are essential to our health. All of this organizing is a self-organizing community. And I thought, wow, <laughs> this is a whole different frame. And when you get into this frame, you begin to understand that life at its deepest level is a fundamentally cooperative activity. That puts you in a whole different realm. And then you begin to understand how the uh, you begin to look at the earth in a very different way. And again, you recognize that as life has evolved on, on earth, um, you know, again, trillions of multi-celled organisms, all self-organizing in a way that maintains the stability of the composition and the, uh, the temperature and the climatic patterns of the planet, maintains the, the composition of seawater, uh, maintains the fertility of soils and the, you know, the story of how this all evolved uh, again through processes that are, you know, they're often, they can often be violent and competitive, but ultimately uh, a cooperative search for ever greater possibility. I think of it as the, the evolution of the whole, come to think of the whole universe as evolving toward ever greater complexity, beauty, awareness, and possibility, um, and this goes way back to the to the to the beginning of creation. What science tells us about the you know the initial bursting forth of a of a great energy cloud that then coalesced and, and formed into uh, into atoms and molecules and then into stars and star systems and planetary systems and so forth, always uh, moving toward greater complexity and possibility and always through these incredible self-organizing processes. Um, and that begins to get us into a very different story, um, starting with a very different story of, of what is life. And then one of the, you know, one of the key experiences along the way, and this, this came out of our, our resistance against corporate globalization, um, that out of the activities of the, that I mentioned of the International Forum on Globalization and these activists all around the world, we began to build this uh, global resistance movements against, uh, against the concentration of corporate power uh, that led to the WTO protests in Seattle in 1999. Um, that sort of burst the whole thing into the, uh, into the public consciousness. But shortly before the, the, the actual uh, demonstrations, um, the, the Washington State Church Council, the Washington State and Seattle uh, Church Councils, uh, organized a conference to uh, 
uh, to prepare people in the Seattle area uh, to, to understand what the issues were around this, this WTO meeting. Um, and I was one of the speakers along with Marcus Borg, who is a, a theologian, uh, I believe he describes himself as a Jesus scholar. Um, and his defining statement that just really stuck in my consciousness was tell me your image of God and I will tell you your politics. And what he laid out is that in the Bible there are metaphors for two very different uh, images of God. One is the image of the, of the, of the patriarch who sits on a throne someplace in heaven with a, with a white beard and rules all. The other is the image of God as spirit, imminent and pervasive manifest in all creation. Now, the distant patriarch sets up a frame of hierarchy and social hierarchy and a dominator structure. Who is closest to God? Um, and in a sense, organizing social power um, by that hierarchy. If you have the image of God as spirit pervasive in creation, then all is connected. Then that is the foundation for a deeply egalitarian, democratic, cooperative form of organization. So that was, that was one of the most graphic experiences of my life of kind of really confronting, wow, how we, ref how we frame the foundational story has deep implications. Now, in various of my books, I have touched on, on elements of that frame um, and the contrast between the, um, the defining images of God, but also then the story as told by the conventional frame of science. And of course the classic frame that the, um, that all of, all of what we experience is reality is basically best described as a grand machine playing out its gears, a, a, a huge clock with its spring winding down. Um, now, this is not necessarily the way most scientists in their personal lives think at this point in time, but it is very much the image that is, that is uh, embraced from science by much of society, the way mo most of us understand the story. Um, that, of course, gets you in a very different picture that there is, there is no meaning or purpose to our existence. Um, it's a basically a very alienating story in its, uh, in its purest form. And so I've, I've related elements of those in my book. But then um, in, um, then a couple of years ago, um, I was invited, to, well, it was, uh, it was in the build-up to Rio Plus 20, uh, so it was, uh, uh, it, was, it was in 2012, um, in March. I was invited to a retreat that was mainly a conversation among indigenous environmental leaders from around the world. Um, and they were preparing to go to Rio to present a message growing out of indigenous wisdom and culture, of Earth as our sacred mother, Earth as a living being, Earth as the source of our birth and nurture. And what they, were, what they were leading up to was a counter to the Wall Street interests that were coming in and trying to shape the uh, the conversation of Rio Plus 20, the, the, the Global Environmental Con Conference, around a frame that said, yes, you know, nature is really important and we have to protect nature and the way to protect nature is to put a price on her. So we have to value Earth, we have to value the resources 
and pay the price. And what, what these indigenous leaders and some of the environmental leaders that, um, that were working with them, the, the, uh, the dominant culture uh, environmental leaders, was that this was all part of the Wall Street plan. This, you know, this had been after the financial crash, and they were looking for new, new opportunities to create new derivatives, new, uh, new financial games to be making money out of nothing uh, at the expense of the rest of society, just exactly the way they did with the, with the housing crisis. And so the idea was to counter that with a story of, no, it's not about price. You know, if Earth is our mother, would we sell our mother? <laughs> She's not for sale. And it's really profound once you think about it. Um, you know, if, if Earth is a commodity for sale, then if it's profitable enough financially, then it makes sense to mine Earth's resources. But what we're actually doing is destroying the fisheries, the, 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 the generative systems that produce our water, the systems that maintain the, uh, the stability of our climate, uh, because it's profitable to do so. And you begin, you know, you look deeper at that, and clearly that, that's absolutely insane. Um, no matter how much money, how many numbers you can generate by uh, destroying the living systems on which our existence depends. Um, it makes no sense, whatever, uh, that if we're going to be responsible to ourselves and to our children and for generations to come, and indeed to the whole of creation, we have to recognize that the fundamental living systems of Earth must be maintained in absolute integrity. And indeed, I think our future is to learn not only to work with them in a way that, first of all, allows nature to heal, and that's part of recognizing that Earth is a living system, um, that it will heal itself um, unless, we have, unless so damaged that it cannot, uh, cannot heal. Um, and our, our hope is to, is to reduce our pressure to allow that healing. Now, once we learn to live with Earth, then we may abs actually be able to enhance Earth's living capacity, recognizing that we are ourselves living beings. We are part of what we best understand as Earth community, which is a phrase, a frame that comes uh, first of all from Thomas Berry, but then uh, was kind of made, made famous in the Earth Charter. Um, and as we learn to live as living beings, we learn to live as responsible contributing members to Earth community. And of course the interesting thing is that all around the world we see more and more people who are beginning to understand um, almost intuitively that we need to transform our agriculture. It's not just organic agriculture, but it's truly working with the dynamic processes of nature, of restoring the so soils, restoring the hydrology, restoring our forest systems, uh, being selective in our harvesting that, yes, we need to use these resources as the basis for living, but we need to be focused on what what is the essence of life? What are the sources of our health, our happiness, our true happiness? Um, and so how do we work with Earth in ways that, that truly optimize who we are and our well-being, but also in, the, in a way that maintains the health and vitality of all of Earth's living beings and of these basic systems that are essential to our being?